Haunting pictures of suffering patients and the health workers who cannot save them, cannot even touch them for risk of contracting a virus which has caused so much fear, panic and stigma. The world's worst outbreak of Ebola began in Guinea almost a year ago. It's killed more than 6,000 people and it continues to spread. In some areas, the fatality rate is as high as 90%. There has been some progress. According to the World Health Organization, 70% of funerals are now conducted in a safe manner. And 70% of patients are being isolated and treated. But these numbers need to reach 100%. Most cases are in West Africa, but the diagnosis of a patient in Spain and four in the US led to mass screening programs at airports. And in New Jersey and New York, health workers returning home are facing mandatory quarantine for 21 days. Pharmaceutical companies are racing to find both vaccines and effective treatments. But this virus isn't a new discovery. It was back in 1976 that scientists first came across a mysterious disease in the Democratic Republic of Congo and named it Ebola after a nearby river. So, nearly four decades later, why is there still no cure? Should experimental drugs be tested on patients in Africa? And why was the world so slow to realise the enormity of the crisis? Today on Talk to Al Jazeera, a leading expert on the disease, Peter Piot, one of the scientists who discovered Ebola. Professor Piot, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. As it stands today, there are no vaccinations and there are no clinically proven treatments for Ebola, a disease you discovered back in 1976. If it had been discovered in, say, the US or Europe, do you think we would have a cure for Ebola today? I think it's likely if this would have been a North American or European problem, we would have at least had far more advances in terms of treatment and vaccines. Now, let's also face it, in uh, 38 years since uh, a team uh, discovered Ebola virus in 76, there have been about 1,500 deaths, known deaths, in in Central Africa mostly, that means about 40 a year. So you can't say it's a public health or it was a public health uh, problem, uh, certainly not as compared to many other diseases where people are dying from. Uh, but everything has changed now with the outbreak in West Africa. Let's take you back to the time when you did discover Ebola. You were a very young scientist. You were sent this blood sample from a nun who mysteriously died in what is now Democratic Republic of, of Congo. How did it come about? Well, we received in our lab in Antwerp at the Institute of Tropical Medicine a, a sample of blood, two samples actually, um, in a blue thermos that a pilot from uh, what was then called Sabina, the airline, uh, brought from Kinshasa with some information and saying um, this is a, you know, a, a nun who died from uh, hemorrhagic syndrome uh, yellow fever question mark and we were certified as a laboratory where I was in training still I was only 27 uh, to uh, isolate what's called arboviruses yellow fever and so on no problem we did the usual routine um, you know uh, isolation techniques for to get a virus out of a blood sample and uh, to our big surprise under the electron microscope we saw a uh, not yellow fever but a very unusual uh, form for a virus. More, looks more like a worm than a uh, you know, virus are usually round or spheres or uh, are in a square and so on. And, um, and that caused a bit of panic because the only known um, virus with that kind of morphology then was called Marburg virus, which had caused some deaths a few years before in Germany, in the city of Marburg, in uh, polio vaccine workers. But we couldn't um, confirmed that this was Marburg or not and so it was at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta in the US that they could say this is not Marburg, it's a new virus. It was a brand new virus, you then actually travelled yourself to what was then Zaire. As a young scientist, I guess despite the deaths that were happening, it must have been quite exciting, quite thrilling. This was a brand new discovery. Well, it was certainly uh, one of the highlights of my life in the sense that it's the dream of every microbiologist to discover a new virus or bacteria, but particularly uh, what I was interested in is 
to figure out how is this transmitted. But I had never been to Africa. I certainly was not very qualified um, or experienced. But in a few days, we could find out in the epidemic zone where a few hundred people had died, um, what the mode of transmission was. Uh, because that was so important to, uh, you know, for later outbreaks also to stop this uh, epidemic. And viruses are transmitted by air, uh, by food, you know, water, mosquitoes and what have you, sex, blood. Um, but we could f figure out that there were um, two basic modes of transmission. One, we found that many people had been infected through contaminated needles and injections in um, this mission hospital in the center of the equatorial forest. And uh, where many pregnant women, particularly, uh, and other patients were receiving an injection. And the needles and syringes were not decontaminated, were reutilized. And that's how you transmit lots of viruses from HIV, hepatitis, but also Ebola. That was very fatal. And then secondly, uh, what we found is that uh, people who were caring for someone with Ebola, in the first place healthcare workers, 11 of 17 healthcare workers in that small hospital died from Ebola, but also during funerals. Um, during a funeral, um, you know, there's a way of saying farewell to a loved one. Uh, people touch the body and someone who dies from Ebola is full of fires because there's vomitus, diarrhea, blood and so on. And uh, that was, they was the two major uh, modes of spread. And that took us only three, four days to, to, to figure it out. And that's still the way that it's transmitted today. How well protected were you, though, at that time? We were not that well protected, we, but we were not uh, naive also. Um, we protected our mouth and, and nose with uh, some surgical mask, you know, but a very, uh, you know, paper one, a primitive one. Uh, had a bicy uh, I had motorbike goggles to protect the eyes and protecting the uh, hands with gloves particularly when, while we were drawing blood and touching patients. Uh, so these are the, the most vulnerable parts of the body, but it's not like today where you come into a kind of a spacesuit nearly. Um, so we were underprotected, that's for sure. And we were lucky, you have to face it. Did you at the time though ever imagine that we would see an outbreak on the scale that we've seen in 2014? I could never imagine that uh, Ebola would uh, become not just an outbreak that's limited in time and people but um, you know just affects entire nations and develops into a humanitarian crisis because that's what we're seeing in West Africa at the moment. Um, never before has the virus appeared in West Africa, that's the first time, it was always in Central Africa. Secondly, never before has it affected capitals and major cities, never before has it affected entire nations um, so this has become a humanitarian crisis that's destabilizing these countries. The outbreak happened almost a year ago now. Yes. Why did the health, World Health Organization take so long to respond to this? Because they did, didn't they? First of all, it took three months to find out that this was an Ebola outbreak. Um, because the first case uh, happened in December and it was only by the end of March that was confirmed to be Ebola. Now that I can understand because you can only find what you're looking for and uh, uh, nobody thought that Ebola um, was circulating in, in West Africa. So there, there's a good excuse I would say, plus um, Guinea uh, has very poor uh, health information systems and laboratories and in infrastructure. But then um, I have much more problems with the fact that it took five months for WHO, for the International Health Regulations Committee because that's what it is, um, to declare this a state of emergency. It took a thousand dead Africans and two Americans who were repatriated uh, to the US because they were infected. There's no excuse for that. Um, already in, in June, uh, the end of May, Médecins Sans Frontières uh, said that this was an epidemic that was out of control. Uh, myself, I also uh, launched appeals at the end of June, early uh, July because what I was seeing is that three countries were involved, cases appeared in Conakry, uh, I said this is different and I called for a, you know, some kind of state of emergency and a quasi-military uh, operation because I said we need, you know, to build an infrastructure to make sure there's, there are enough beds for treating people and all that. Uh, so it was, um, 
It took too long. And because of that, a slow response, both nationally, because there was a lot of denial by the authorities in all countries in the beginning, maybe because they didn't know what it was. Um, we wasted so much precious time. And Ebola, frankly, at the moment, we still have medieval type of control measures. It's isolating patients, providing some care, uh, putting contacts in quarantine, making burials safe. This is not a, exactly for my, our high-tech 21st century, when you think of it. And a proof that it can be done was um, given by uh, three countries recently. First of all, the DRC, Congo, where they had an outbreak of Ebola in uh, August and uh, entirely with their own uh, forces, they made a diagnosis, they contained the outbreak purely by Congolese. Senegal had one case, contained it, and was absolutely very well prepared. Um, Nigeria also, you know, um, contained it. And certainly Nigeria and, uh, and Congo are uh, often quite chaotic type of countries, and they did it. So it's possible, it's avoidable. Clearly, richer, wealthier nations could have done more sooner. But you think there was a sense that everyone felt, well, this is Africa's problem, Africa's dealt with it before. You know, we don't need to concern ourselves with this. I think that we still haven't fully internalised how globalised our world is. It's not only the stock markets that are global, but also pathogens. And uh, we saw that in a spectacular way when we had, over 10 years ago, this SARS outbreak, starting in um, China, cases in Hong Kong, someone travels to Toronto, causes an outbreak, causes the deaths of several people, and, and that will happen again and again. And so this is a matter of um, security, in a sense, for every single country in the world. And uh, the problem has been that there has been denial at all levels uh, and inaction. We've been told repeatedly that Ebola is actually very difficult to contract, yet we see so many health workers who presumably have had the protective clothing, were wearing it, and have still caught the disease. Why is that happening? It's true that Ebola is not so easy to contract um, unless you really touch someone who is sick with Ebola and particularly when you have contact with body fluids. Now, when you are a, a nurse or a doctor or a caretaker or someone who buries uh, uh, someone who died from Ebola, that's exactly the contact you have. And uh, let's not forget that over 350 nurses, doctors um, and hospital workers have died from Ebola already in West Africa plus a few elsewhere, um, and they're the front line. And that's also why uh, Ebola has such a devastating impact, because it paralyzes a whole uh, health system in addition to, uh, to killing people with Ebola. Now what happens is that um, despite the protective gear, there's always a vulnerable moment. Uh, that vulnerable moment is particularly when you undress. Um, and then there's always a possibility of a needle stick and so on. But, it's mostly, uh, I should say though, um, healthcare workers that, that have been infected uh, when they didn't know that someone had Ebola um, because there are the Ebola treatment centers in West Africa and there have been fewer nurses and doctors infected than in the general health services. Would you feel safe working in a treatment center in West Africa or indeed as a member of the, the burial teams, would you feel happy to do that yourself? Yes, I would. Um, I would be very careful. I would uh, make sure that um, there's always someone with me. This is what uh, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, does, that, who checks on me whether I don't do any, you know, stupid things to say so. Uh, um, make sure also that um, when I feel too stressed or too tired, that's when you should stop. Um, caring for patients also, uh, because that's when you, uh, you know, you may drop the ball in terms of, uh, of safety. Yes, I will. And I'm going to Sierra Leone soon, so I want to see what, uh, what's going on. Has there been too much of a sense of panic, particularly in some US states where returning health workers have been forcibly put into quarantine? There's an epidemic of Ebola in West Africa and then there's a second epidemic, an epidemic of mass hysteria that we saw particularly uh, in, in North America. And uh, uh, the, it was really um, out of proportion with the, with the issue. Of course, people have become infected. One nurse has become infected uh, in Texas. Um, 
but uh, you know, putting people in quarantine who returned from West Africa uh, for 21 days, as some U.S. states are, um, you know, imposing, one doesn't make sense from a public health perspective. Um, it's not cost-effective, and also it's a major deterrent and disincentive for, uh, you know, supporting. Um, you know, the countries in West Africa affected by Ebola. On the one hand, countries like the US and the UK um, really provide admirable support, um, money, human resources, even the military, and that's great. But you can't then say at the same time, when you come back, we put you quarantined for 21 days, because then, you know, the number of people who want to do this, they all have usually a busy life. Uh, they won't be uh, you know, volunteering anymore. And those volunteers are vital, aren't they? They're vital. I mean, let's not forget that as a result of um, civil wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone and then years of corrupt dictatorship uh, in Guinea, that um, most professionals, including health professionals, have left the country. So there's a huge need for people on the ground uh, because also taking care of Ebola patients is extremely labour intensive. You can't do like in another hospital, uh, you know, a normal way uh, where you spend eight hours on the wards and so on. Here it's like more in minutes, you know, half an hour, one hour, and then you've got to go because it's too risky for the healthcare worker. Where I think that um, the impact that we can have from the outside is very limited is stopping transmission in the community. You need people who speak the language, who understand the culture, who um, know what people think and feel to make burials safe, uh, to um, you know, make sure that people are not becoming infected uh, while caring for their loved ones um, and understand uh, transmission of, uh, you know, of this infection. Because um, the concept of um, an infectious agent is not always there. People may think it's witchcraft or uh, someone wanted me to, uh, to die or whatever. We've seen that in places like Liberia, things are actually improving. But for example, in Sierra Leone, things are getting worse. Are we over the worst of the outbreak? Is it now contained? We've undoubtedly made progress in terms of um, more hospital beds for Ebola patients and uh, safe and dignified burials and so on. All that is being put in place. It's not perfect yet, but good progress compared to a few months ago. And in Liberia, there's uh, absolutely, there's a decline in new infections and in deaths. Um, not everywhere in the country, but in Sierra Leone, it's still going up. And in uh, Guinea, it's kind of stable. But stable means that, uh, you know, there is always the, the same number of people who become infected per week, every week after week. So not that much progress. And let's not forget a few things. One, this whole epidemic comes from one individual. That's mind-blowing when you think of it, but, uh, but it will also only be over when the last person with Ebola has either died or recovered without having infected anybody else. So even if Liberia is going down, um, it will not be over until it's over everywhere. And uh, because of the uh, high mobility and of people, but also the fact that uh, the borders are kind of fairly theoretical in many cases, um, we, we need to approach this also as a region. Um, we need to make sure that we have efforts going on in uh, every part of the country. Ebola is not something that spreads um, in a um, homogeneous fashion. It pops up here. A burial there, okay, 30 people become infected. They go back to their villages or their towns and then infect someone else. It hops around. The human misery caused by Ebola is absolutely horrific, as we've seen by the terrible pictures coming out of West Africa. But in some ways, is it almost good news for scientists who want to study the disease and are working towards some sort of vaccination, some sort of cure, because you actually have patients that you can work with? I hope that this is the last Ebola epidemic where all we have is um, isolation, uh, some supportive care and putting people in quarantine, because that's what we have at the moment. Uh, and that we will make use of this uh, outbreak to test experimental vaccines and experimental uh, treatments, therapies, because they exist. And that is the good news, I would say, that uh, that's starting to happen now. Um, treatment trials are starting 
and the only way to find out whether these drugs um, work or vaccines protect is to, to test them in, in humans during an outbreak. But that has never been done and it has formidable um, logistical, ethical and, um, you know, and then uh, scientific uh, challenges. But we must overcome these because otherwise um, next time we'll have to start from scratch again and that would be unacceptable. Yeah, there's been a lot of debate ethically about giving these experimental drugs to people with Ebola. But for example, ZMAP, which was the only one that seemed to be around at the time, I think has only really been given, as far as I know, to uh, Westerners returning from Africa. And there haven't been enough doses to be able to be taken to Africa and given to the patients there. I mean, ethically, surely that is wrong. Yeah, there, in the case of ZMAP, the, um, you know, the production is uh, very, very limited. That's going to improve. But only um, yeah, expatriates uh, have, uh, have had it, with a few exceptions. In, I think in Nigeria and in Liberia, um, and none of these patients were randomized to a, a placebo versus a, you know, the uh, experimental drug. So we should not ask from uh, the African populations to, uh, to do, uh, you know, in terms to accept a placebo while we're doing these trials, as we've done uh, since we've not done it for, for Americans and Europeans. Um, but the good news, again, is that uh, trials are being put in place. There's great support uh, from various research institutions like the Wellcome Trust. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is doing a good job on this one to bring together all the players, coordinate it, make sure there is sound ethical uh, advice because we can't take shortcuts from the ethical side. And uh, these trials are now being starting uh, very soon uh, in the field. Um, and I th I'm optimistic. I think that in a few months' time we will know um, which therapies are uh, working and which are not. How easy is it though to get scientists and drugs companies and governments all to work together towards either a vaccine and or a cure for Ebola? Because the pharmaceutical industry is that. It's, it's a business, it's an industry, it's all about protecting your interests, protecting your patents and, and making money out of drugs. It has actually been quite a smooth ride um, and where we are in nearly daily contact, scientists, people on the ground, um, you know, like uh, working in, in Médecins Sans Frontières, um, also the World Health Organization convening, um, a clinical trialist. That's because it's an emergency. I think that has brought us all together and funders have come in also. The Wellcome Trust has launched a special program, the European Commission, um, so that's good news, I would say. And that's why I'm optimistic that we will see results. Um, it took a while before we all got our act together, but now it's this really uh, all stops out and uh, uh, the, the key is now to do the trials. If there's one good thing that perhaps comes out of this outbreak that's caused so much human misery in West Africa, is it going to be that the West is now going to look at Africa's public health care, its infrastructure and think, we actually need to get involved in that. We need to help improve it. We need to donate more money because what happens in Africa affects the rest of the world. Do you think that will happen? I hope that a few things will happen. One, that we have a paradigm shift in the sense that for future epidemics, whatever there is available as experimental drugs and vaccines, we will promptly uh, test and evaluate so that people can benefit from it as soon as possible. That is new. That's what we're doing with, during this Ebola outbreak. Secondly, that this is a wake-up call, that um, we must invest in um, better health services in some countries in Africa, like in West Africa, very vulnerable countries, um, health information systems, that we have better surveillance so that we can pick up when a new outbreak starts much, much earlier than being the case now. And also that there is a um, total awareness that we are a globalized world, that um, we must not only invest in our own health safety and security, to use these words, but also elsewhere. And I think that um, has a good chance of happening, but because we should not let go by this epidemic uh, without thinking of the future. It's reconstruction of the countries, of the health services, but then also uh, for better global preparedness. Professor Piot, thank you very much for talking to Al yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.